Uh, kia ora everyone and welcome to our July webinar uh, with Andy Fenton and Gavin Mitchell from New Zealand Micrographic Services. They're going to be talking to us today about all things digitisation and strategy. So I'll leave it to them to do our webinar and introduce themselves. Yeah. Kia ora tato, ko Andy Fenton, toko inoa, ko Gavin Mitchell, uh, tōna inoa. Um, I think um, just by way of intro, uh, we're from NZ Micrographic Services and uh, we've put the general thrust of this paper uh, or this presentation onto a paper that's on our website under the resources tab. So Julia will furnish the links for that uh, later on. Um, I wanted to introduce Gavin Mitchell who uh, a, a good number of you will know now. Uh, he came to us uh, as NZMS as a consultant um, reviewing the value proposition of our product Recollect. And a bit like one of the themes in the presentation we've got today, uh, a big part of um, uh, the reason he came was because we knew someone we trusted implicitly and he recommended Gavin very highly. Gavin had a good look at Recollect, got right in amongst it and uh, made some very significant changes. Um, as it happens, we had some staff changes, ended up becoming the program manager. And, um, and then within a few months of that was the general manager of the company. So world domination is clearly in his sights. Um, and, but what I'm trying to say is he's pretty bloody brilliant. And you're going to hear a lot of him today. Not too much from me today, which is probably gratifying on the Leanza stage. His background's in that value proposition work. But he's also got extensive history in the software companies with Crown Research Institutes, Jade, and he even led a um, software investment company, which was publicly listed. Uh, so quite a pedigree, and I think it's great we get the chance to hear from Gavin. And I'll be chipping in with some um, anecdotes as we go through. So Gavin, over to you. Okay, um, the premise for today is very much, sorry, I'll just get on to the right screen. Very much answering questions that come up when we talk to customers on a regular basis. Um, so frequently we're talking to our customers and it's clear that their digitization program is being handled in a very piecemeal fashion. Um, and the, the questions that need to be answered when you move into major projects haven't necessarily been addressed as clearly as they might have been and possibly it's not obvious to everyone what those questions should be. So today is very much around addressing the, the why, the what, the who, the where, the when as much as the how much you might look at it in a digitization program. So in this discussion, we should cover off for you the reason to digitize, the amount of planning you should put into your program, what you need to think about with your collection, uh, what you need to think about with resources and what resources you think you'll need, what standards you might want to adhere to and comparing in-house to outsourcing options and possibly a blended model from that, then considering timelines and budgets before you get to coming up with your solution. Um, so the question is if you have a physical collection that needs to be digitized, you really need to think of, come up with a well thought out strategy. And there are two phrases that um, come to mind regularly when I look at projects and major programs of activity. The first is what represents fair value to stakeholders? Um, several things in that one sentence and fair value to stakeholders. The first is who is the stakeholder? Is it you that are planning the digitization program? Is it the end user? Is it, is it the owners of the collection? Uh, identifying who those stake, stakeholders are and what they consider fair value is an important consideration, particularly when you look at procurement when you're addressing the question of, am I going for least cost, best value, best fit um, in the process? And the second item um, or thought that comes to mind for major programs is, is it fit for purpose? And there's often a tendency to aim for, you know, the best possible solution when in actual fact, it may not, you know, what you do, determine to be the best possible solution may not actually be fit for purpose or may not represent fair value to the stakeholder. It's easy to overinvest, to overcapitalize in your projects where the value isn't recognized. So for me, looking at major programs of work and when we're talking to our customers about um, their projects, I'm always trying to understand who the stakeholders are, what represents value and therefore what is a fit for 
purpose outcome? Uh, and I think these are some very important questions that you need to address on the way through and not immediately lead to conclusions that we need to spend the money on a massive preservation level program of work when that may not be appropriate and may not represent fair value for stakeholders. That's just a, a brief introductory statement. The starting question is always the why. Um, and the why is, um, has many answers according to the organisation. Um, disaster protection is obviously a good starting point. Um, how do we preserve in the case of earthquakes, fire, water damage, um, theft, um, handling damage, and so on? Um, the second obvious one is the preservation. These are precious artefacts. There are very few copies of them. They represent um, a large part of our organisation or the country's heritage. Um, and digital access is another good reason. Um, and digital access is a part of preservation, meaning that more people can have access to the content without damaging the content. Um, but all of those reasons have got different outcomes and different standards required and different processes you might go through um, in thinking about how you're going to build a digitization strategy. So having started with the concept of why do I need to digitize and what is my primary focus with the program, that will lead us through a number of other questions that come up in planning. Yeah, I think um, it's a, a nice point to make. Um, uh, I've digitised a lot of material over the years for people who, quite frankly, are sick of being on the desk and having to go down to storerooms in the back to get the same stuff out over and over again to that customer demand need. And I think another good reason, which uh, is on the fringe of all this, is people's desire to tell stories nowadays. And how can you facilitate that uh, by going about your digitisation program? Is it part of your mandate to facilitate that? So having come up with the reason why, that gives us the opportunity to move into a clear planning phase. And for any major project, and it might be a short project, but it's major, um, or it could be a large project that takes time, but anything of importance needs to be planned carefully, and you need to work through a number of steps. So some of the high-level things to think through, and we'll talk through these on, on some slides shortly, but setting clear objectives is vital know what you're trying to um, achieve and knowing what success looks like once you know what success looks like that's your destination and it's easy then to set up a plan to achieve that destination but be clear about it be clear about the things that are important and the things that are less important and use those priorities seek value for your stakeholders which i've covered understand the true costs so it's not just the cost of a person, but will I have to recruit the person? Will I have to train the person? Will I have to manage the person? Um, if I buy a piece of equipment, will it last the life of the project? So there's a number of costs in there that you need to consider. You need to look at your options. Um, do I use my existing staff? Do I hire people? Do I go outside? So some of those will cover. Timelines are important. The, the why often, you know, the why digitise will often set the timeline. We need to do it by this date because that our building is um, going to have some earthquake remediation done to it and we need to clear our collection by then. Um, or it might be that our collection is failing rapidly and we need to get it into um, a better environment where no one can touch it. Um, to resource appropriately, don't be skimpy on the resource. Um, but make sure you've got the right resource in place. Set up your program structure to succeed. So everything you do in your program needs to target that success um, and plan how you're going to measure progress. Um, you won't reach your goals unless you measure them. So moving on, the why. Um, define the reason. We covered that a little bit before. But, you know, is your material... Um, significant? Is it a demand question? Is it a risk question? Andy, what have you come across over the, the years on this? Well, I think just outside that door where we're sitting uh, right now, there's some burnt minute books, uh, which are incredibly brittle and fragile. Uh, so decay is a real issue. Um, as Gavin mentioned before, sometimes the collection is at risk. 
we've got a collection of microfilm which is fused to itself. Um, and what we're doing there is a damage control approach just to get the best of what we can from it. Um, we've also got some audiovisual material we're digitizing at the moment. Uh, the magnetic media, of course, is under great stress, uh, which is a worldwide problem. Um, so that's just current jobs. But over yeah. the years, those sort of things are all major issues for us. There's a collection of planes, uh, mine planes, that, that we're digitizing, which are being included as part of a mine rescue program for the country. And the digital output is very important that it is accurate to scale so that it can be included in the GIS system. So it's another reason that organizations find to digitize. I hope it's not a metaphor that they arrived in coffins. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a metaphor that like coffins. Okay. Um, so the next step is assessing your collection and understanding the impact of material type on your program. That was it. Hmm. There's a, a wide variety of materials obviously um, possible and considering what you've got will determine the approach you'll take to your digitization project. Um, whether it's photographs, transmissive, such as glass plate negatives or slides, whether they're bound volumes, whether they're large documents, do they need to be scanned in pieces and joined together? Do we need large format scanners? Um, do I have a range of collections that means I don't have a dominant material which means that the cost of setting up an internal program to cover all of my collections may be prohibitive. Have I got 80% of my materials in one format that I could focus an internal team on and then outsource the digitization to others? Um, often materials being digitized elsewhere, so repatriating those digital copies into your collection may be an effective outcome. But in many cases, earlier digitizations have been extremely poor and those digital copies need to be replaced with something that's far more accessible and more representative of your needs. Um, and rights, uh, another vital piece is do you have the rights to do what you plan to do? And who needs to get copies of your output um, as part of um, your stakeholder management piece? And at the bottom, best return on investment, back to fair value of the stakeholders, what represents the right outcome? Should we digitize the entire collection or are there just elements of it? What's our priority in terms of uh, which material needs to be captured first? Is it whole collections? Is it subsets of collections? So these are questions that will determine how you move forward with your digitization program. Actually, a quick nod to um, has it been digitized elsewhere? I think one of the problems we've grappled with over the years, and those that have attended Lianza conferences, national digital forums, will certainly have heard me push uh, for a national register of newspapers. We are possibly guilty of the very success of papers past. It's so brilliant um, that there is a comfort zone of feeling that um, newspapers are covered because they're on papers past. But the truth is, it's got a truckload up to 1920, about half of the papers ever printed, um, and a smattering up to the end of World War II. But between there and 10, 15 years ago, nothing. So if we're not looking after them, we're not telling people we're thinking of digitizing these, getting the rights approved for them, then we could be doing ourselves a disservice through repetitive work or letting the collections miss out. So do think carefully about sharing knowledge and where might be, who are the natural aggregators of knowledge of collections that are being digitized? A little plug for Hansard too on that. Well, uh, I'll send a tweet round about that one as well. That's a great success story. So having addressed the why and the what, the how question is the big one. Now that we know what it is we want to digitize, um, we start to think about how we're going to do this. And you have options, the in-house versus outsourcing, a blended model perhaps. But regardless, you still need to think about the people you're going to have involved in this, whether it's the people that um, pull the, the collections out for digitization, uh, whether it's the people actually doing the digitization, but you need to put a structure around that team. It's important that you have a governance model, a group who take oversight of the project and approve changes to it, and the ones that you can take decisions to, to have those decisions approved. 
So having set your goals, the governance group is all about enabling you to reach those goals and giving uh, visibility to the project to others inside an organisation or within the stakeholder community. So governance is something that I will stress over and over and over again. Make sure your programs are governed effectively. Then you need to have a manager with support that will take ownership for getting things done. And then you need to have an appropriate group of people doing the doing. There's no point in having the doers doing their own thing. They need to be coordinated. The manager does that and the governance group makes sure things runs very smoothly. So please, if I can stress one thing out of a planning exercise, is think about how you're going to govern your program. It is a key element to achieving success. Um, the next part is expertise. Do you have the expertise in-house? That's fantastic. If you're going to use that expertise, what is their day job and who will do that if they're working on this program? I'm just listening to a webinar. Um, if you don't have the expertise in-house, how are you going to gain it? Are you going to hire somebody? Have you um, got the ability to find the right people? Um, if you don't have the ability to, to hire, maybe you're going to train someone on site. So how are they going to get the training and how will you know the training looks right? So when you look at the team, look at the expertise you need, it might not be in terms of digitization. It might be, have we got the project management skills to actually run a large program? Have, do we need to hire in a contract project, project manager to achieve the outcomes, or do I need to train someone up to project management? If I train them to project management, what project management methodology is appropriate for this project? And then we're down to, um, what archivists do we need? What um, collection management skills do we have or do we need to bring into the team? What digitization, what post capture processes? So all of those things need to be thought through. The people cost is not just their salaries. It's the cost of recruitment. It's the cost of management. It's the cost of retention. Um, and if you're looking at a major program of work, perhaps several years, um, expect people to churn through the project. You know, you manage it in a way that people won't leave, but it's natural that people find other interests elsewhere, um, life changes, people move on. So you need to be able to manage the, the movement of people at all levels in and out of a, a project. We have a major project underway at the moment where it's taken nine months for this organization to make their procurement decision and the person leading the business requirements and effectively was the internal business owner, literally retired on the day that the contract was signed. And so they're handing over internally to the next person and passing the baton. Managing those processes is really important and there's a cost associated with that. Time. Think about how much time you're making available to your team to do this job. Is it appropriate? Is, is it being costed? Um, appropriately in a time budget as well as in a cost budget. And to be realistic, giving people too much time is often as bad as giving them too little time. People tend to get lost in details when there's no time pressure. So ensuring that people are achieving an appropriate throughput through the project is how you manage your time budget. So you need to think that one through carefully. And again, back to what is fair value for stakeholders? You know, how much would, should we invest in this? What is a realistic approach? Equipment, um, yeah, there's a whole can of worms in equipment. There are 12 answers for every technical problem that you have, um, and uh, the context determines what's the right outcome. So you can't walk into this project with a fixed view. Now, if you have existing equipment, that's a great starting point, but be honest with yourself, and it might be that that gear is not up to the task. It might be um, too high end for what you're trying to achieve, and the cost of putting your project through the high end equipment, it might take too long, therefore the unit costs are too high. Just because you've got it doesn't mean you should use it. Vice versa, using a photocopier to try and get preservation standard um, images of um, documents is a pretty poor outcome. 
So fit for purpose and fair value again comes into that. The next part of the resourcing is making sure you've got the right space. So in a digitization environment, so we've got the equipment handling, sorry, not the equipment, the material handling. Have you got the room, the right environment to handle the materials as they come out of your collection space and are being prepared for digitization? In the digitization suite, have you got the right lighting? Is it color balanced? Does it have the right um, color range? Is the equipment appropriate? Have you got room to use the equipment? For example, if you're using an overhead camera, um, can you get the camera high enough to be able to capture um, the image that you need to at the right resolution? Some rooms simply have a ceiling that's far too low. Uh, is there too much light reflection in the room? Is the humidity and temperature right for the room? Do you have space either side of the digitization equipment to have your material waiting to be digitized then placed after being digitized? Can you create a workflow in that environment that becomes efficient? So all of these things come into it and it's a very important um, piece of a digitization environment to ensure that the materials are uh, managed properly, that the workflow happens efficiently, that you get the right outcomes. And you have missed anything. Yeah, the obvious one for me is where is the stuff stored and getting it to and from that space that Gavin's articulated. Uh, I think um, you've got to make sure you've got good access passageways and the right gear to move the stuff to and from, whether you're in-house or outsourced. So having thought about your resources, the next thing to think about, and it's more of the what that we asked earlier, is what output are we going to produce into what standards are we going to work with? Andy's got far more experience in standards, so I'll get him to run through this. It's my geek session. Um, if you haven't heard of FADGI, um, that's something you should write it down. Um, I think we like to talk about it in these circles, and it probably sets a benchmark worldwide now. We've tracked it since about the late 90s, I think. Um, and it came together as a conglomeration of universities, museums, and libraries I think in the Western States uh, of America, uh, and it's just gone from strength to strength. They released um, standards in 98, 2004, and updated in 15 and 16, which is the current initiative. Um, it sets the benchmark for top of the line preservation standard digitization, and gives you a graded scale all the way down. As Gavin mentioned, not everything has to be done to preservation standard. I think in New Zealand, we're probably guilty of tracking that way a little bit on projects and deep diving into elements of digital preservation that, sorry, preservation standards, digital masters, that probably don't need uh, to be used all the time. The archives in America also offer some good standards. They're a bit dated now, but they're very easy to read, which is why we like using them uh, and referencing to them. Um, there's a nod there to Archives New Zealand. Um, not all imaging is cultural heritage um, uh, needs. Some of it is business needs uh, for business records. And there is um, a slim uh, level of standards documented in that one. Uh, you'll get this link on a, uh, in a paper we're going to put out later, so you don't have to uh, worry about the fact that this URL is underlined. Um, but the key premise around those record keeping standards is doing your business record keeping to a level that uh, keeps the purpose of the digital record commensurate with what the original was for. So it must be legible, it must be interpretable, and if there's any context around the document that is important, other than the content on it, then that must be captured as well. So quite simple specifications in that regard. And the last one is we've talked a bit about handling and the space you work in. Uh, that bottom uh, bullet is uh, from our big three cultural heritage institutions. Uh, and they've got some fantastic advice, which um, must be read, for looking after your collections pre and during and post digitization. Right, so now that we've gone through um, standards, the other thing we need to think about is how do we achieve those standards post capture? So some equipment's got very good automated software that gives you the output that you need, but typically you're going to need additional processing post-capture. So you need to think about how you're going to um, manage your images, how you're going to crop them, how you're going to color balance them, how you're going to make sure you get an output in a format that you want. 
you need to think about your file management. So where are we going to put it? How are we going to name them? Indexing and metadata. How are we going to extract useful information from the documents um, and images that we've been capturing? So how do we manage our content and text conversion to give us, trans um, to give us searchable text? Do we need to use internal transcription or external transcription? Um, what OCR software might we use and so on? And then we need to think about um, how are we going to share and access um, the digital files. Typically you're going to want to share them, but not everyone does make them available for sharing because of the nature of their collection, but you still need to access them. So you'll need some sort of a um, content management or a collection management platform that enables you to find and access those easily. Um, those systems should link everything through the metadata to make things easily findable rather than just following a series order to be able to use metadata to access content in, in any type of query you like. If you plan to share, how are you going to engage your community, whether it's a local community or a professional community? How are they going to work with this content? Are they just going to want to look at it on the screen? Do they want to download it? Do they want to be able to add their comments or suggest corrections to it? So how do you get more value out of your collection through an engagement process? And finally on this slide is the, how do you manage your records post digitization? Just because they're on a computer somewhere doesn't mean they don't need management, but they may not need conservation. So you need to think of your record management, digital record management, much the same way you think of your physical collection management. Someone needs to own it, someone needs to manage it, someone needs to make sure it's accessible, that metadata is managed, that they continue to be improved and so on. So it's a hidden cost that not everyone thinks of. It's a, a natural assumption that once it's in maybe our server, all's good. Not necessarily the case. Managing your digital records is as important as managing your physical records. All right, so having gone through all of this, we now know what we, why we want to digitize something, what we want to digitize, what resources we're going to use, what standards, what output, the question is where. And it's the who and the where, and because of who we are, naturally the first option is to think about outsourcing. And of course we're gonna tell you there's lots of advantages. Um, the reality is there are some disadvantages. Um, you know, you don't have the in-house capacity and expertise that maybe you'd like to continue working through. Um, there needs to be a high level of trust between the owner of the collection and a digitization agency like ourselves. Control becomes an issue on how you manage control and of course transport and security becomes an issue. However, there are some strong advantages. Um, you access to experts, people who do it all the time, people who do it efficiently. Um, there is a far lower risk of getting poor quality outcomes because you can always ask us to redo it because we didn't meet the standard. Um, and it means that you can manage costs on a per unit basis, it's a fixed cost operation, and allows you to focus on your main business. So there are some pros and cons to this, and we're quite happy to talk to people about that. Similarly, you might think about doing this in-house, and that's perfectly valid. And we help a number of organizations achieve exactly that. Um, the advantage is you have in-house knowledge and expertise. Um, you get to control the handling of your collections and also manage the level of output. The downside is you also have to manage the level of output. Um, it doesn't happen automatically. Um, it gives you some flexibility. You can change what, what you want more easily. Um, and obviously the security risk is much lower. But the disadvantage is it's a much larger investment. Um, not just people, not just premises. It's time, it's impact on business as usual. Um, there's a number of inconveniences associated with it and the management of the equipment can be reasonably significant. So things you need to think about um, with equipment for example is not just fit for purpose but fit for the life of the project. Um, we plan with our equipment um, an economic working life and we know for example that we might get 250,000 images out of our DSLR before it's at risk of failure. And if it fails, 
then our contingency needs to be replacing it or fixing it and knowing that it'll be away for 10 days while it gets fixed. Um, other pieces of gear will cost a lot more money, but we might get a million images out of it before we reach the end of economic life. So all of these things need to be considered on the way through. And then there's the upholding and managing standards, which is um, for some organisations bread and butter, others it's a lot, lot more difficult to achieve, um, might be because of size or other reasons. So what I'm hoping I'm painting a picture here is there is no easy answer. And in fact, usually the best answer is a blend of both of these two options, where you say, 80% of our material looks like this, so we could invest in a digitization suite to manage um, that 80% of our collections, but we'll outsource the, the 20% that's perhaps 10 different formats, while the 80% is only two formats. So, you know, talk to us about, or other providers, about what is the best approach to get uh, fair value for stakeholders and a fit for purpose outcome from your project. Um, so then we're down to the when and how much the timelines and budgets. Really that you don't start with a budget. Um, if you do start with a budget, it's a much more difficult um, process. You really need to work through this and often the best way to come up with a budget is to conduct a small pilot. It could be an internal pilot or it could be an external pilot with a provider that gives you an idea of likely throughput to achieve certain quality um, and will give a nod to um, how much space, how much resource, what uh, um, time frame it will take to complete the project and give you some levers to play with in terms of if I have a shorter time frame, how much more resource do I need to put into it? What does that look like in terms of equipment? Do I run multiple shifts on the same equipment? There's a raft of things, but that pilot will often help you understand the size and shape of the budget that you put together. Um, if you can't manage a budget, then sit down with, with people that can give you some ideas. Um, and organizations like ourselves are more than happy to, to sit down with you and help you understand how to create your own internal budget on this. We'd rather give advice than see you fail. Um, so, so talk to us, talk to experts, talk to other people that have done it before. So ultimately you end up with a solution that's shaped to suit um, your purposes. It should be fair value to your stakeholders. It should be fit for purpose. And it is probably going to be a blended model of some sort. Um, some people opt for the full in-house, some people stay with the full outsource. Both are perfectly valid, but often a blended model works very, very well. Um, key thing is measurable outcomes arise from the existence of a digital resource that demonstrates change in the life or opportunities of the community for which the resource is intended. So measurable outcomes. You know, let's get the most out of your collections for your community. And I think that leads us on to just a list of further reading that we'll share. As Andy said at the start, a lot of this is in a post on our website. So if you go to www.micrographics.co.nz and go to the resources tab, it is the most recent post. Um, otherwise, um, these links will be available um, from us on our website or Julia may well be making them available through this slideshow. So Andy, what have I missed? Not a lot. Uh, I'm interested to see what, what the question stream's like. I, I think the the one thrust I want to make here is um, Gavin's been talking about uh, projects that are quite small size through medium, through large, through mass digitization, and the principles apply to all of those. Yes. And I think being a bureau, um, uh, one of the great advantages for us is we have a well, numerous uh, scanning devices at our disposal. Yeah. We're also prepared to work shifts because we do run a night shift from time to time. So once you assemble all of those um, uh, components, you really can face any any project you like. So one thing I'll, I'll stress, I talked before about governance and team structure. Um, scale is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Your governance might be the, the library manager and there might be a team lead that's running the project, there might be three people running it, but understand the roles, understand the processes for making decisions. 
So everything we've outlined here applies whether it is a very small internal project through to an extremely large two year long mass digitization project. The principles apply. Don't think because your project is short, you don't need to think these things through. For those that don't know us so well, we are literally in the last throes of a job that's involved over a million images that's taken 49 weeks. Yes. Um, and we've also just digitized one family tree for a person. So um, we do scale accordingly. It's not a sales pitch. Well, I've got the floor. It's a good opportunity just to plug the new lands of July magazine. Julia, I see you posted that just in time. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm just giving people time to write some questions if they want to. Um, but um, another plug for the APLIC uh, Asia Pacific Library Conference, which Leanza is uh, helping to organize. So I hope the St. Kiwi is going to that. Myself and Tyler from our organization are going. Um, and you may see that Gavin and I are representing Gillian Whitmore, um, who's sitting over there very quietly, terrified she's going to make a noise. Uh, mm -hmm. But she's been a marvellous help, uh, along with Julia, who you can all see, um, putting this together for us. So uh, a big shout out to you guys. Thanks very much. So, questions?